Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Rose City, to Rose City Community Church. And for those of you watching online, we welcome you also this morning. We thank you that this is a day that the Lord has made. Church, let's rejoice today. Let's be glad in it. Let's give thanks to Him with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind. We thank you, Jesus. Father, we just come before your throne of grace. And we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Every day, Father, that we get to come and, and worship you. Every day we get to thank you and give you glory and honor that's to your name. Father, we thank you that, Lord, we are here. Huh? We are here, God, to worship and exalt the name of the Lord. Our God, we thank you that there is no other name but the name of Jesus. And we thank you that, God, we can come and we can stand before your throne room of grace. And we can come boldly and we can ask, Holy Spirit, move in this place. Holy Spirit, move within us. Father, we God, we thank you that we are the vessels that you choose to move through today. We are your vessels, and we thank you that, God, that as we keep praying, the Holy Spirit dwells and lives on the inside of us. And we thank you that, God, we allow you, Spirit of God, to have your way. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you that, God, you said you work, you move, you have your way to those who praise you. So we thank you this morning, Jesus.
our heart is coming back to true worship, God. We're laying all those things before your throne room, at your feet, God, and we're coming back to worship you. We're coming back to give up all of who we are to you, Jesus. And we thank you, Father God, because we're coming. You desire to fill us with more and more of the Holy Spirit, more of the fire of God, more of the anointing of God, more of the love and the joy and the peace of God. Father, you're filling us, and we desire to be filled today to overflowing, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you this morning. We bless your holy name.
trusted. We are not men that you should lie. Not the son of man that you should repent. You have said it and you will bring it to pass. You have promised it and it shall be so with you. It is yea and amen. So be it. So be it. So be it. Oh, uh -huh.
trusted with our finances. We know you can be trusted with everything, oh God. You can be trusted. You can be trusted. You said, seek me and find me. If you seek me with all your heart, we seek you, oh God. We seek you, oh God. We seek you, oh God. In the morning, we seek you, oh God. In the noontime, we seek you, oh God. In the day, we seek you, oh God. And in the night, we seek you, oh God. And we know you will hear and you will answer. You will hear and you will answer. Because you can be trusted. Because you're a defender. Because you are a miracle worker. Because you are a promise keeper. Because you are a comforter. Because you are a counselor. Because you are a teacher. You are a defender. You are a protector. You are a savior. You are a redeemer. Oh, you are everything, oh God. You are everything, oh God. And you can be trusted. You can be trusted. You can be trusted. So I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never
So when those voices come that say he's not going to come through, you remind him that your God will never fail you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Trust in him.
hearts and our lives, Father God, and are continuing to do so, Lord God. God, we place our lives, we place the situations that we're facing, we place that all in your hands, Father God. whatsoever, Father God. But Lord, I pray that each one follows hard after you. In Jesus' name, Lord God. And so, Lord God, we thank you as they go to their classes today, Father God. We thank you for their teachers. We thank you for the word that is shared to them today, Father God. And it's not just words that are spoken out in the atmosphere, Father God, but Lord, it's words that are penetrating their hearts and their minds and their spirits, Father God. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, touch each one today, Father God. Continue to give them a hunger and a desire. For the things of you, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God is good. I should actually ask you all to move in, but I'll let you sit where you are. Hallelujah. Gives me a chance to walk around. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God is good. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, Father God, we thank you. God, this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice, and we will be glad in it, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be in this place in your presence today. We thank you for the opportunity we have to, to be able to be here, look into your word, Father God. Lord, we thank you for what you want to reveal 
to each heart today, Father God. But Lord, as always, we pray we will not just be hearers of that word, but we will be doers as well. In Jesus' name, we praise and thank you. Everyone in agreement said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen, amen. Hallelujah. Well, I want to say this right off the bat, because what I'm going to be sharing this morning today, you say, well, wouldn't this be a better message for December? Okay, it's, well, it's appropriate any time, all right? Now, I'm sure many of you have read the Christmas story in Matthew a thousand times, okay? You probably know it frontwards, forwards, backwards. But you know what? As re you need to read it again sometime. And as you read that, you, I, in fact, I read it recently, I was reminded in a new way that the events of Jesus' birth were instigated and orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, Matthew began his account by cutting right to the heart of the story. Mary was with child by the Holy Spirit. It says that right there in verse 18. Matthew. Now this stupendous, never before heard of, and never to be repeated event, fact, was continued, uh, sorry, was confirmed, pardon me, to Joseph by an angel in verse 20. Mary's conception was of the Holy Spirit. See, the greatest miracle in history was the result of the Holy Spirit's activity. You know, I, I'm sure we'd all agree that a pregnant virgin is indeed a miracle. Amen? Miracles do happen. Amen? And the reason is that, that, that God, the Holy Spirit, is real and is at work in the world. Amen. Whenever and wherever the Spirit shows up, the miraculous is possible. Right. Amen. Amen. So I want to, as we look into the Word of God this morning, I want to consider how we can experience the miracles. The miracles of the Holy Spirit. We can pray. Bless you. Hallelujah. The miracles of the Holy Spirit. Actually, another way we can put that, the surprises of the Holy I love the Holy I love surprises. Well, let's talk about the Holy Spirit surprises. Amen. All right, now, I am not talking here about presuming on God or demanding something from Him because we happen to name it and claim it, okay? We serve the God of the extraordinary. Amen? The Holy Spirit has unlimited power. But He exercises it according to His timetable and His agenda, not ours. And He wants us to seek Him. Right there, we need to catch that. We are to seek Him. We're not to seek the goodies. Amen? In fact, one of my concerns for the body of Christ is that when you look at the great God we serve, it's a tragedy that so many of us live predictable lives. We operate by a predictable theology that allows no room for the Holy Spirit surprises. Too many of us would be hard put to describe the last time the Holy Spirit did anything out of the ordinary for us. And that's tragic. Because the Holy Spirit's presence guarantees that we're not limited to the ordinary or to the natural. See, and I'm thrilled as we, as we you know, you read, 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 read the Christmas story, okay? You know, and as you're doing that, realize again that the same Holy Spirit... He has not changed. Okay, the same Holy Spirit who conceived a child in the womb of a virgin is living in you and I. Same power. Same power. Same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you didn't know this already, He is a miraculous person. And He always changes the equation because nothing is impossible with God. Amen. So, let's, we're going we're to get into God's Word this morning. And we're going to find out what God has to say about the, mir the miracles of the Spirit. Amen. Now, I need to begin by defining a term that I'm using here. When I'm, a miracle, okay, a miracle is the action of God that interrupts the normal course of events and produces a powerful and or unusual result that would not have occurred otherwise. Say I'll say it again. A miracle is the action of God that interrupts the normal course of events and produces a powerful and or unusual result that would not have occurred otherwise. And we can then call them the spirit surprises 
Because a miracle is out of the ordinary. It is God's surprising power at work. You know, I heard of a, of a, of a, about a couple that were told by the doctors that they could not have any children. And so what they did, they actually, they adopted a baby. Yeah. Only to find out two days after the adoption went through that the wife was pregnant. Yeah. You know, and I know there's many other Christian couples that can testify and give a similar testimony. It looks like the Holy Spirit is still in the business of doing miracles in the womb when it fits God's purposes. Amen? Yeah. And that was certainly the case with Mary and Joseph. Because her problem now, her problem uh, was not the inability to conceive. That's right. Okay, she was a virgin. There was no human possibility of conception, so her child would not come through the normal course of events. Mary's life would be infused with power from above, the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, when you have the Holy Spirit, come on. come on. When you have the Holy Spirit. You have the person behind the miraculous activity that breaks the norm. Yeah. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't do miracles in the man. His miracles are always purposeful. Yes. According to his purpose. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God never does a miracle just to show off. <laughs> yeah. Or because he's in a miracle-working mood. <laughs> From God's vantage point, miracles are always well calculated. See, one reason for, for, for miracles is to open up a greater opportunity for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be shared. Amen. 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 Miracles can be used to open people's ears and eyes to the gospel. That's right. Amen. You know, the angel told Joseph about uh, Jesus' birth. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For it is he who will save his people from their sin. That's right. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. The Holy Spirit conceived a baby in the virgin's womb because a Savior was needed to pay for our sins. Mm -hmm. So God performed the miracle of the virgin birth to accomplish his purposes in bringing about mankind's salvation. See, and many of the miracles that, that Jesus and the apostles performed in the New Testament, such as the healing of the blind man in John chapter 9, opened hearts to the gospel. And in many cases, resulted in a great number of people coming to the Lord. I mean, hey, you think about it, the miracle of Pentecost is a classic example of this purpose for miracles. Now, the other reason the Holy Spirit does miracles is to bring greater glory to Jesus. One of the great problems with people who want a miracle a day is that they is is that they what they want is often unrelated to God's glory. They only want the miracle for themselves. That explains why Jesus he was so he was upset. Well, I don't want to use the word upset. He was you know, eh, upset works when he healed the ten lepers and only one came back to praise and glorify him. You look at Luke. There's a good word. Disappointed. There you go. Luke 17, you can mark the verses down. Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. Jesus said, hey, was there not ten cleansed? <laughs> but but, but the, the nine, where are they? Mm -hmm. The other nine took their miracle and ran. <laughs> they apparently did not have time to bring glory to God. See, our priorities are badly misplaced when God gets shoved into the background. The Spirit interrupts the mortal course of events with a miracle when God's glory can be enhanced. And that's why it's so important that we live for the glory of God. Yeah. Amen. See, the more glory God can get through us, hello, the more miracles He can do for us and through us. Ooh, come on, come on. So if you, are, if you are living for the glory of God, and I trust each one of us is if we are living for the glory of God, guess what? We are a candidate for the miraculous. Because His own glory is what God is after as well. You know, in the book of Acts, the apostles were doing one miracle after another. You know, you read Acts chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, you'll see that God was getting the glory. God was getting all the glory. In Acts chapter 4, verse 21, 
underscores this by telling us that when the people saw those miracles taking place, they glorified God as well. Amen. You can mark down Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 31. Gives us another beautiful example of this purpose being fulfilled. Great multitudes of sick people were brought to Jesus, and he healed them all. In fact, verse 31 says, The multitude marveled as they saw the dumb speaking, the crippled restored, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. See, then the Holy Spirit... He still performs miracles to fulfill God's sovereign plan. We see this in, in Matthew chapter 1. Let's, back, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Let's look at verses 22 and 23. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jesus was the fulfillment of God's divine plan. Amen. Mary was a part of a miracle that occurred to help fulfill the plan that God had uh, determined from eternity past and it prophesied many centuries earlier in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit does miracles to achieve God's program. So let me say again that when you're, when you're interested in the proclamation of the gospel, living for the glory of God and committed to the plan of God, you are a great candidate for a miracle. Mary's pregnancy was part of God's greater plan. To the degree that we are in God's plan, the Holy Spirit is free to bring Him glory and transform the souls of people through His miraculous activity in our lives. Now, the question might arise. What exactly is the prerequisite for a miracle? Well, the simplest way I can state this is to say the prerequisite, the prerequisite, the prerequisite, I'm going to get the prerequisite. <laughs> the prerequisite for miracles is faith. Amen. <laughs> now, I know some will point to those cases where people are told uh, the reason they weren't healed or whatever it is that they didn't have enough faith. Mm -hmm. I know some people use this argument to explain perhaps why their prayers or laying on hands didn't work. Let me say that I am not talking about using faith as, as an excuse for a miracle that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Talking about biblical faith as a necessary ingredient for a miracle to take place. God does not produce miracles merely because we have faith. But he, but he also does not usually perform miracles in the absence of faith. Okay, now Luke's version of the, of the Christmas story illustrates what I mean by what I'm talking about here. Mary's relative Elizabeth. Okay, Elizabeth's husband, Zacharias. I mean, godly people. Sure. Godly people who were very old, very barren, and well beyond childbearing years. Yet an angel appeared to Zacharias in the course of his priestly duties and announced that Elizabeth was going to have a son. <laughs> now, we're talking a miracle here. Yeah, we are. Okay? Now, Zacharias... Old Zach, he, he knew his physical condition. Not only did he know his physical condition, he knew his wife's physical condition. So he questioned what the angel was telling him. Whereupon he learned that he was speaking to Gabriel, who had come straight from the presence of God. What's more, because Zach did not believe in God's, sorry, did not believe in the Holy Spirit's ability to do a miracle in Elizabeth's body, he got to spend the entire pregnancy in silence. <laughs> Nine months. <laughs> Couldn't say a word. Oh, no. <laughs> in other words, his lack of faith disqualified him from the full enjoyment 
of participating in the miraculous activity of God. His response did not change what God planned to do. Okay? But it sure changed his enjoyment of what God planned to do. I mean, what a contrast when we come to Mary later in Luke chapter 1. When she asked the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? This was not an expression of doubt, like Zach's question. <laughs> Mary knew it was impossible for her to get pregnant. Besides, the angel hadn't yet told her how all of this would come about. But notice that when Mary is told that this will be accomplished by the Holy Spirit, in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, what did she say? Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Her, her immediate response, in verse 37, pardon me, her immediate response is a declaration of submissive faith. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. See, Mary believed the word of God over and against her physical circumstances. She did not know how but she did know who. See, and when you and I are properly related to God, we don't have to know how God's going to do what He wants to do. We just have to know that it's God who's going to do it. See, too many of us, we're trying to figure God out. But God has already made it clear that He is unfigureoutable. <laughs> Get your tongue around that one. And I know that's not a word that we normally use, but God is unfigureoutable. That is, He does not always make clear the mythology that He's going to use when the Holy Spirit performs His miraculous activity through His people to accomplish God's glory and God's, pro God's program. Well, Mary's question, how is this possible? And when the angel answered, the Holy Ghost is going to do this, her response was, well, I don't believe that. That's never been happened before. I want a doctor to substantiate it. No, she didn't ask for any of that. She simply said, Holy Ghost? Whew, that's all I need to know. Wow. See, when the Holy Ghost is involved, God is not necessarily going to use a method that we're familiar with. He's not necessarily going to use a normal means. So we need to, hey, stop trying to figure out how God's going to do everything and be content with this knowledge. Holy Ghost, hey, that's all we need to know. Amen. Come on. Yep. Amen. Come on. There's, a, there's some other examples of how people's faith became a prerequisite for a miracle. Matthew chapter 9. Let's turn there. We're in the book of Matthew. Let's flip over to chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, right here we have a miraculous display of Jesus' power. Look at this number of verses, verse 2. So then behold, they brought to him a para paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Look at verse 6. but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your home. Verse 22. Verse 22. Uh, let's see, where is verse 22? But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Verse 29. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. Three examples right there. Right there. See, we need to see more of, of, of supernatural intervention like that. Why don't we see it? Well, hey, you know, maybe we're not expecting it. Maybe we're not believing that the God for whom nothing is impossible can work out 
in our situation or circumstance. Mm. Let's separate faith from presumption. Mm. Presumption says God must do it because we say so. Really? God doesn't have to do anything. Right. We presume upon Him when we take that approach. <coughs> now let me quickly head off what may be another false assumption that we could draw from what I just said. That is to avoid presumption, we should never ask God boldly for what we need if we believe it's within His will to grant it. Again, looking at the examples that we just cited in Matthew chapter 9, in each case, the people involved approached Jesus with great boldness. We know from Mark chapter 2 verse 25 that the paralytic's friends took the roof off the house to get to Jesus. That's right. I always laugh when I read that story because we read the Bible like a newspaper. I've said that many times, okay? Jesus is preaching, and all of a sudden, you know, this guy's here. He was on a bed. Okay, so it wasn't a little hole they let him down through. <laughs> they didn't let him down by his neck. Okay, they had to make enough space. The guy, let's just say he's, you know, six feet tall. Okay? That's a big bed. So they, lay, they, they, had, to, they had to get him up on the roof, first of all. I don't know what the roof looked like, but they had to get him up on the roof. Then they had to break open the roof. And lower him down. Wow. Now, can you imagine you're the homeowner? <laughs> you're sitting there listening to Jesus, and all of a sudden you feel a little dust on your head. And you look up, and all of a sudden there's a guy peeking down at you, and you're like. And then you look a little bit more, and suddenly the hole gets a little bigger, and a little bigger, and a little. Next thing you know, they're lowering a body down. Right in front of Jesus. Right in front of Jesus. <laughs> Come on. Interruption. We know I'm sure the paralytic's friends took the roof off the house to get to Jesus. Yeah. The woman pursued him in a crowd and grabbed his robe. The whole crowd of people, and she went up and touched the hem of his garment. Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52 says, One of the blind men, blind Bartimaeus, literally yelled his head off. <laughs> Streaming, yelling for Jesus' attention for a miracle. Mm -hmm. Well, faith does not have to be timid. Mm -hmm. Faith says God can do it. Yeah. That's, right. yeah. That's his ability. But faith, also, but faith also says God does the thing I'm believing him to do. You see the difference? Yeah. I say this because we have a generation of Christians whose theology is unrelated to life. They go around saying, God can do anything. But they cannot point to anything God's doing for them. It's because their theology is in the abstract. They've heard it preached somewhere that God can do anything. But they've never said, God, I believe that you are great enough to do something for me. Whether you choose to act is your prerogative. But I'm believing you and counting on you. Jesus did not do many miracles in his hometown. Scripture tells us that, Matthew uh, 13, verse 58. Jesus did not do many miracles in his hometown. Why? Because of their unbelief. I pray that we are not missing out on many of the things that the Holy Spirit would do for us because of our unbelief or lack of faith. Well, say, how can I know when I'm trusting God? Well, that's a good question. When you act on what he says, even when you can't figure it out, how he's going to do it. You know you're trusting God by where your feet are taking you. That's right. Trust goes beyond a feeling. That's right. You know, faith is Peter stepping out the water. And not just theologizing. I can't even get my tongue around that one. Theologizing? Mm, <laughs> sure. Well, we all, you know, God's ability to be able to do that. And God's ability to be able to keep you afloat. He could have stayed in the boat. Could have stayed in the boat. I know that he's able to keep me from drowning. I know he can make a way. I know that he can hold me up. But if he doesn't take that step out, that's faith. Let's try to say this word again. Theologizing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Theology. Theology, but theologizing. Yeah. But that's not a working faith. James chapter 2, verse 14. Faith is stepping out in the water. It's believing that God not only can, 
but if it pleases him to do so, he will. That's right. Amen. Amen. You know you're trusting by the way you're walking and not by the theology discussions that you're having. Mm. You know, we, we know Joseph had faith, going back to where we started this morning. We know Joseph had faith because he heard from the angel. He took Mary as his wife. Matthew chapter 1, verse 24. Before this, what was going to happen? Before this, he was getting ready to divorce her quietly. So he wouldn't have to, he wouldn't hurt her reputation or his integrity. But when Joseph heard from heaven, he said, I believe God so completely that I'm going to go through with this marriage. Joseph believed God and he acted on it. So did Mary. In Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55, Mary glorified God for this miraculous thing that was going to happen to her. Right. See, the prerequisite for the Holy Spirit surprises is always faith. Mm -hmm. You must not only believe that He can, you must believe that He does. Yes, the only question is, will He at this time for you? Now, I wouldn't be, I'm sorry, I wouldn't be honest with you if I did not tell you that a miracle may not happen. Unless somebody tells you that, you're not going to get the whole story. Miracles are God's prerogative. Our job, our job is to live by faith and get ourselves in a position where the Holy Spirit is free to work His miraculous power in our lives. See, and there ought to be, there ought to be more miraculous testimonies coming out of the body of Christ about what the Holy Spirit is doing amongst us. Yeah, true. Amen. True. I, I don't need... Sorry, I don't necessarily mean a big miracle. Okay, we think some huge, humongous, whatever. For some of us, a miracle might be getting a good night's sleep. <laughs> yeah. Hey, come on. Yeah. 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 Because we're overwhelmed by life circumstances. Mm -hmm. Whatever the need, I'm convinced that the miraculous will, will be involved when the Holy Spirit is at work. But we have to get prepared. So, well, how do you prepare yourself? I'm glad you asked that question. Mm -hmm. There's an important clue in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. You can mark it down. Matthew 1, 19 and Luke 1, 28. Joseph and Mary were candidates for miracles because they were righteous people. They were described as being righteous. The Holy Spirit was free to do His Holy Spirit thing, if I can put it that way, because their passion was living for God. Did you catch that? Their passion was living for God. Amen. See, if you and I are to be candidates for the Holy Spirit's miraculous, then living for God and pleasing Him must become the passion of our lives. Amen. 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 I don't mean we've got to be perfect. Okay, because none of us are there. I mean, hey, when we mess up, life forms to the left. But when we mess up, we fix it as soon as possible so that we are got our, that right relationship happening with the Lord. 1 John 1 9, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's not a license to sin. That's right. Okay, but when we mess up, we've got that scripture verse that we can use and run to him. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 See, the drive of Joseph and Mary's lives was honoring God in their attitudes and their actions. They had a passion for holiness. Mm -hmm. That means if you need a miracle, the way to get it is not to go miracle hunting. Mm -hmm. Any more than the way to receive a spiritual gift is to go gift hunting. Mm -hmm. Instead, put, the, the princi put this principle down in your book. Passion for Jesus. Passion for Jesus is the key to the miraculous and the miracles of the Holy Spirit. Passion for Jesus. There is a direct correlation between the fervor with which you pursue and you, and you have your walk with Christ and the power that you experience from the Holy Spirit. And what happens, unfortunately, too many of us, we lose that passion. We lose that passion for Christ. When we lose that passion, we've got that, that relationship has to be hot. That relationship needs to be on fire. Yes. Oh. Amen. Hallelujah. When we lose that passion, Thank you, Jesus. we're in danger of losing access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember that one of, 
our foundational passage for this, this series that we've been talking about, the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 14. We read that the Holy Spirit's task and his passion is to glorify Jesus Christ. So, you know, if Satan wants to keep you from experiencing the power of the Spirit, all he has to do is lower the flame on your Christ, on your Christ burner. All Satan has to do is cool your passion for Christ, and the loss of power will follow. And it's interesting, new Christians, they often see a lot of the miracles, the miraculous taking place, they're newly fallen in love with Jesus. And the presence of the Holy Spirit rides in the back of that passion. If you want to see the Spirit's miraculous intervention in your life, then you must pursue a passion for Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let me tell you what a passion for Jesus Christ is not. It's not simply academic knowledge of the Bible. You know, Royal City Community Church, we love the Word of God. Preach it, teach it, try to enforce it. We do everything we can to honor the Word, but it's possible to know this book and not know the Lord. Right, that's right. It's possible to know theology and be spiritually cold inside. Come on. Knowing the Bible is necessary to having a passion for the Lord, but knowing the Bible is not equal to a passion for the Lord. Mm. Our problem is not loving the Bible too much. Our problem is loving Christ too little. Now, you know, you can read this every single day, right. twice on Sunday, <laughs> without a passion for Jesus. That's right. Just knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that passion, when I use that word passion, it's an, it's an emotionally charged word. Mm -hmm. But I chose it on purpose. Because God does not want our limp, lifeless religious activity. You know, you, you can go to church 52 Sundays mm -hmm. out of the year. Mm -hmm. You can go to Wednesday night services when we've got them and still be as cold as a doorknob on a winter day. Come on. The Holy <coughs> Spirit wants to cultivate within each one of us a warm, fire, throbbing fire, passion fire, for Jesus fire, Christ. Fire. 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 Thank you, That's why Romans chapter 6, 17 talks about obeying the Lord from the heart, not merely as an exercise in eternal Extra, pardon me, external religious activity. Now let me tell you something about passion. Anybody who's loved anybody else passionately knows that passion left uncultivated will die. You know, some marriages can testify to this truth. Passion is not cultivated, will die. You know, you two people can start out in a marriage, passionately in love. But if that passion is neglected, if that passion dies, something happens to that relationship. They may still be, they may still be doing married people types of things. He still goes to work and brings the money home. She's still doing that as well. Or she, you know, house cleaning, whatever, the whole nine yards. But a husband and wife can do all those things without any passion. That's because passion is not cultivated simply by performance. It is cultivated by performance that has relationship as its goal. You can go to work. You can bring home, you can bring the money home simply because it's a joy, and you know if you don't, if, and you know if you don't pay the bills, you're going to have no place to stay. If you want the Holy Ghost power and the Holy Ghost miracles, you must develop Jesus Christ passion. Which means you do the right things with the right goal in mind. I mean, how many husbands and wives sat in counseling sessions? And the man might say something like this, Hey, look, I, I do this, and I do this, and I do that. And the wife responds, Well, that's not what I need. <laughs> that's, very that's a very informative statement. The wife is saying, Hey, what you're doing is okay. But what you're doing is not touching where my heart is aching. It's not cultivating my passion. Same thing can happen in our relationship with Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit is tied to a passion for Jesus Christ. You can see a fascinating example of this principle in reverse. In Acts, you can mark this verse down, Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. 
And it's the story where you've got the seven sons of Sceva. Okay? And they were trying to cast out demons by the power that Paul was using. So these guys, these seven sons of Sceva, they saw, you know, Paul casting out demons by the power of God. They said, hey, that wow, looks pretty good. <laughs> Let's try a little bit of this hocus pocus. And they tried to cast out a demon, but the demon said, I know Jesus. I don't know Paul, but who the heck are you? <laughs> and the demon possessed man clobbered all seven of them. <laughs> what did Paul say? That I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That I might know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Paul was ready to forget everything else to know Christ. Unless the goal of your life is to know Christ, anything else you do is like the husband whose efforts are okay but aren't touching his wife's heart. You know, in Acts chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says that it was apparent to everyone in the Sanhedrin the apostles that had been with Jesus. They couldn't argue with the miraculous power that had been, dis that had been displayed through Peter and John. Because the man the apostles had healed was standing there with them. How about the guy that gave beautiful? Silver and gold have we not, but such as we give you. Look on us. Guy standing right there with them. Completely healed. This is the guy that sat at the gate begging, alms. He's standing right there in front of the Sanhedrin. Healed. Healed yeah. The apostles' passion for Jesus had produced the miraculous. And one woman put it to her husband this way. I would rather have you stop working two jobs, <laughs> lose her house, move back to one car and an apartment, and yet have each other, than to have you work two jobs, have a house and two cars and extra money, and yet not have each other. Mm. Get the idea? The Holy Spirit would rather see us have less performance and more passion than more performance and less passion. So let me close this message this morning by giving you three suggestions to help you retain, pardon me, well retain, that's a good word, regain and sustain your passion for Jesus. Number one, set aside regular time for meditation in God's Word and in His presence. Now notice I did not just say, read your Bible and pray. In fact, one of the signs that we're losing our passion is that all our prayers start to sound the same. <laughs> See, when routine sets in, that's when passion leaves. When you have passion, you make a way where there is no way. You come up with new ideas when you have passion. The key thing here is meditation. It's taking time to roll God's truth around in your mind, letting it sink in. When David said, Lord, show me marvelous things in your law, he was not just saying, hey, help me understand the Bible. He was saying, let me see you in your word. So when you sit down with your Bible and, and, and have that quiet time, time to pray, God is asking you to meet with him. Remember the Holy Spirit. Got a number of names, but one of them, he's our guide. So that our Holy Spirit is our guide into a whole new realm, the spiritual realm. It's when we're in touch with the Spirit that he begins to reshape and recreate our lives and develop in us a passion for Christ. That's why if you're trying to get a married couple to rekindle their passion for one another, you have to get them talking to one another. So, find a nice quiet spot. Grab a cup of coffee or tea or whatever it is that you enjoy in the morning or whenever you do this. Sit down with, you, with, that, with that coffee, open your Bible, and because the Bible is, is reflective of the mind of Christ, Christ is sitting at the table with you as you talk. But you say, well, that's just a one-way conversation. No, once you add the, dyna the dynamic of meditation, you've initiated a two-way conversation. 
The Holy Spirit is now free to rule the truth of God through your mind. God talking to you. Amen. Number two. A second way to rekindle your passion is by addressing sin directly and completely. We have to address sin because when you sin against another person with whom you're in relationship, fellowship and communication is broken. When you confess your sins and trust the blood of Jesus to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness, you're essentially saying, Lord Jesus, I did this. And I confess it because I don't want anything to break our relationship. So I'm trusting your blood to wash me and restore that relationship. That's number two. <clears throat> number three, third means of restoring passion is to remember what we discussed earlier in this message. Our confidence must be in Christ and not in our performance. Our confidence must be in Christ and not in our performance. And many of us believe that because we're doing the right things, Christ is happy. The Holy Spirit's satisfied. That's a little trickier than that. You need to do the right things to be sure, but you cannot trust you're doing the right things to give you a passionate relationship with Christ. Many of us are guilty of trusting what we do instead of trusting Christ to take the right things and make a relationship out of them. We need to pray, Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you to bring us closer together. I'm trusting you to take my Bible study and my time of prayer and my obedience and, and, and my church attendance and, and, and my ministry involvement and all the other great things that I'm doing and turn those into something that you can use that we will, might be able to have that better relationship. Now remember Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Martha, as you know, was busy serving and getting upset at Mary. And Mary, what was she doing? Was she, she was spending all her time in Jesus' presence instead of helping out in the kitchen. And Jesus gently rebuked Martha and said that what Mary had could not be taken away from her. What Mary had was a passion for Christ. Do not let anyone take away your passion for Take, take away that passion that you have for Christ. Amen. Now, this is interesting, and I'm getting close to wrapping up. This is interesting because of the scene that unfolds later when Lazarus, you know, of course, he was the brother of Mary and Martha, and he dies. And when Jesus arrived, Martha runs up to him and said, Lord, what did she say? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus responded, said, I am the resurrection and the life. A few minutes later, Mary ran up to Jesus and said exactly, essentially the same thing that Martha had said. Only this time, Jesus wept in response to what was said. What a contrast. Martha spoke to Jesus and got solid theology in response. Mary said the same thing. Jesus wept with her in her grief. Jesus listens to people that he's related to. Now Martha, don't get me wrong, Martha was a good woman. But she did not have Mary's passionate relationship with Jesus. So Martha got theology. Mary got a miracle. Because Jesus asked her to be taken to the grave. Asked, sorry, Mary, because Jesus asked to be taken to the grave and he raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, if you've not seen them online, the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Mm -hmm. You want to know the secret to that church's power. <coughs> the secret is not on Sunday morning. The secret to the spirit-empowered ministry of the Brooklyn Tabernacle is on Tuesday night prayer meetings which begin at 7 o'clock. By 5.30, 5.30 p.m. Tuesday evening, there is a line of people wrapped around the block to get into the prayer meeting. The church has to keep people at bay because of the number of those who want to come into the presence of God to hear from them. 
No wonder hardly a week goes by at the Brooklyn Tabernacle without somebody testifying about the, a miracle that the Holy Spirit did. A wayward child that's come home. A marriage that's been restored. Some of the doctors have given up on is healed. Every day, every week, there seems to be a new miracle because every Tuesday night, there is a time of concentrated, passionate prayer. The secret to the ministry of the Brooklyn Tabernacle is not its program. It's the member's passion to love and serve God and to be in his presence. Jesus himself described it as loving God, loving the Lord, your God, with all your heart and soul and mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. See, Jesus, he looks at passion like this and says to the Holy Spirit, let's do some miracles. I want to experience every legitimate blessing the Holy Spirit has for me. How about you guys? Amen. Until and unless the words of the prophet Zechariah become the model of our hearts and the modus operandi, if I can put it that way, of our lives, that is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, we will not discover or experience the glory of what it means to be children of the living God. So it's my hope. My prayer that God will ignite, and I want every head bowed, every eye closed, please. It's my hope, it's my prayer that God will ignite in each one of us a passion for a relationship with His Holy Spirit that is so deep and so intense that we will suffer any inconvenience, we'll endure any trial, we will face any challenge to make sure that we are cultivating and experiencing an ultimate walk with Him. What miracle, what miraculous thing do you need to see from the Holy Spirit? Cultivate your passion for Jesus and you will experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Father God, right now, my prayer for each one today, Lord God, you know each one that's here today. God, you know the ones that are listening and watching online later today. God, I pray right now, you know where each heart is today. God, I pray for a renewed passion. I pray for a renewed zeal. God, that we are not content, we're not satisfied with where we are at, but God, we desire daily to press into you. God, I pray right now that you increase our capacity right now, that hunger, that desire, that thirst, that burning passion, God, for all that you have, all that you want, all that you desire to pour into our lives, Father God. But Lord, we are in pursuit of you. And so Lord, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. God sees our hearts, and it's easy to put our hand up. But God sees each heart. So Father God, you see where each one of us is today. You see if we were going to have a scale of 1 to 100. You would see where we fall on that, on that zeal. It's 100 being the top, you would see where each one of us is on that scale. And Lord, you're desiring for us, Lord God, to go above and beyond with our passion and our zeal for you. So Father God, you see each heart today. And God, I just pray, oh hallelujah, I pray for the fire of the Holy Spirit right now to so fill each person, each individual, each household here today, Father God, with a renewed passion, with a renewed zeal, with a renewed fire in each heart and each life. God, we're not we're tired of paying lip service to you, Father God. We need to be tired of paying lip service to you, Father God. Today, 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 we have to be willing I heard somebody say, hey, if you're willing to do business with God, God's willing to do business with you. And what that means is, hey, that a renewed passion, a renewed passion, a fire. So Lord, in Jesus' name, right now, fill each one. But Lord, maybe there's somebody here today, somebody here today that has not come to that place where they've asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of their life. You've not accepted Jesus Christ. You, you, you're in church. 
Maybe you've been in church all your life, but you've just gone through a religious thing. You've not had an encounter with God. You've not had an encounter with Jesus. You've not come to that place where you've accepted what Jesus Christ has done on, beh your, on your behalf of that cross of Calvary. And say, Pastor David, that's me. Today, I need to come to a saving knowledge of God. I need Jesus Christ in my heart and my life. I cannot continue down this path anymore. I need him today. You lift up your hand and say, Pastor David, that's me. I need Jesus in my heart. I need him in my life right now, today. Anyone at all. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray each one has come to that place, that saving knowledge of God. You may be here this morning. And you may be in the place of what I've described in this message, where maybe, hey, you know, the passion's not quite where it should be. You've kind of walked away from God. I said this many, many times, you've walked away from God. God has not walked away from you. So yeah, yeah, you're, you're born again. You're still going to glory when you pass on this earth, you know, the whole nine yards. But that zeal, that passion, that fire... And you want to come today and say, hey, Pastor David, I want to renew. I want to get that back into a right relationship with God. You lift up your hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, born again, right relationship with God. The last thing, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We were sharing earlier, the Holy Spirit is given, not just for the sake of being given, but you know what, hey, <laughs> might receive power that we might be witnesses. We're a testimony. So yeah, there's a great benefit being, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit, the power that's available, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is available to each one of us. You're here today, you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit evidence by speaking with other tongues. You need that power today. Yes, yeah, you, you're, you're going through your Christian life, and you're, you're, things are going okay. But you know how much, so much more it can be better. Because you know what, there's just some stuff that the Holy Spirit, you know, you're coming up against some stuff. Yeah, you can pray in English. It's fine. But there's some stuff, and the enemy's throwing stuff at you, and either you can thank God for that heavenly language. And you can begin to pray, uh, speak out that, that heavenly language, and begin to see situations, circumstances turn around. Because you know what? The devil, he had no idea what you're talking about when you're going there. But you're speaking the Holy Spirit. You're speaking to God. You're communicating to, through, in and through Him and through the Holy Spirit. Somebody like to receive that gift of the Holy Spirit and by speaking in tongues in through tongues. Anybody today? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Anyone here today, you need prayer in your physical body. You just raise your hand. Praise the Lord. Anyone need your prayer? You just lift your hand up. Our sister back there, just raise your hands towards her. Father God, right now, in Jesus' name, we thank you right now. Healing power, healing virtue flood into her body right now. We thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, that she's healed whole and well, Father God. Lord, I thank you, God. She is a candidate for the miraculous. I believe right now, Father God, that her passion and her zeal for you knows no bounds, Father God. So, Lord, in Jesus' name, God, you do what you're famous for. You touch her right now. You restore her health, Lord God. There's others that we're praying for as well. Lord God, there's a number of people that aren't here today because of sickness. Thought, Father God, we pray for them. Thank you for healing power, virtue flood into their bodies. Thank you for touching and healing and strengthening them, Father God. And we expect to hear a good report, Father God of what you've done, the miraculous that's taken place in their bodies. We praise and thank you for that now. In Jesus' precious name, oh, hallelujah, amen. Amen, 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 hallelujah. God is so good, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. In a few minutes, we're going to just do quickly announcements, but I want to uh, pray over the offering. Continue to thank those that have been so faithful with their tithes and with their offerings. Uh, those of also that have been doing it through uh, e-transfers as well. We had a number of e-transfers that uh, come in every week. I think uh, 
since COVID hit, I think there's probably only been about three, three weeks that we've not seen uh, something come through, either through the mail or through an e-transfer. So again, thank you so much for being faithful with your tithes and offerings. Blessings upon you. You see the different ways that we're able to give. Offering envelope on Sunday, you can uh, mail it in. Very few people mail anymore because of the e-transfer, but that's the third way that you can do that. So, so Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. Cool, oh, hallelujah. Father God, we thank you that you are our provider. And God, we thank you that we can come to you today, Father God. We thank you that we can praise you. We can bless you. We can thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to give. Lord God, in Jesus' name, it's a joy. Oh, hallelujah. A joy and a privilege it is to be able to give into the work of your kingdom, Father God. So Lord, today, as always, we ask that you bless both gift and giver. To your glory and honor, we praise and thank you right now. In Jesus' precious name, everyone in agreement said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Quickly draw some announcements to your attention. Just reminding you that we have, <laughs> talking about prayer, we have three different opportunities that we can come together to pray. We can come online on Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, I sent an email out. It gives you the information on how you can join us for that time of prayer. So please encourage you to be a part of that. Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Uh, we also have on Thursdays, we have drop-in prayer here in the sanctuary from 11 till noon. Okay? So if you've, got, if you've got that time, you're free, uh, please come and join us. Please come and join us. Maybe you're not working that particular day. You work part-time. You're unemployed. You're retired. Whatever. We are here from 11 till 12 on Thursdays. Please come and join us. Hallelujah. And then, of course, we have Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings here in the sanctuary, 10 a.m. You can join us for, for prayer prior to uh, the morning service. So three opportunities. Please make those available to yourselves. Amen. Uh, also, reminding you, you can see over to, the, to my right. You can see we've got the food bank table set up over there. Uh, this is the first Sunday. We're, there's five Sundays in June. And we're encouraging each one to, uh, to bring uh, those non-perishable food items over the next five weeks. Well, it's four now, uh, the 9th through the 30th. Uh, please check the date. <laughs> please check the date. I, I'm always amazed that we've gotten way, way better at it, okay? But we always look through it, and I'm always amazed. I look at it, 2019? <laughs> you know, don't, don't be bringing something that is old as the hills and probably is, you know, like, it's got to be current, Okay. Because we're turning around and we, we want to bless them. All we're doing, if you're bringing something that's old, we're doing what you should have done with it, is probably throw it out. Okay, so uh, please check the dates when you bring this stuff up. Please encourage you, each one, please be involved with this. We have a great opportunity to be a blessing in our community. Also, reminding you that uh, two Sundays from today is Father's Day. And because of that, uh, Sunday, June the 16th, right after the morning service, uh, we're going to honor